Welcome to Catholic Views. I'm your host, Casey Bassett. Renee is out, taking some much-needed time off, so I'm going to be filling in for her. I'll stammer through this. This is my first time hosting one of these. We've got a really special guest today here for you, though. Uh, Well-known throughout the diocese, been at a lot of different parishes, beloved priest with us. I'd like to welcome Father Mike Wensing on the show today. Welcome, Father Mike. Good morning. Thank you. You bet. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Father, Father Wensing about his vocation story and his life growing. It's a very interesting story. I've heard bits and pieces of it here and there as I've talked to him, but I'm sure there's a lot more he can fill us in on. So I think, Father, what we'll start off with here is, is from the very beginning, your ancestry, because I believe, and I might be mistaken, you wrote a book on your ancestry, correct? It was because of COVID. I've had a box of notes from grandparents' stories, great uncles and aunts, and just personal um, research that I've, I've I've done over the years, and I said someday I'm going to um, I'm going to write. Well, COVID locked me into my uh, room or apartment, and when I had just started up retirement, so that's what I did the first year, 2020, uh, 2021, uh, worked on it. And Amazon has it. It's called uh, Ancestry dot mine m i n e. Just a little play on that under my name, Michael Wensing. Uh, I begin in Europe, and with most of our immigrant history, uh, the um, reasons for emigrating to America, some were religious. I had I took the four lines of paternal and maternal grandparents and, and, and researched the best I could. There were some stories that were passed down from Europe from the 1850s and 1860s and the 1880s and, and 90s were, because they came at different times, and one was for a uh, uh, Economic two were actually for economic reason. One was religious reading, reasoning, and the other one was uh, 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 political or military. Uh, sure, a bit of a, a flight from the uh, unification of Germany under Prussia, and there okay. was a pressure that uh, this particular ancestor did not want to participate in. And that most people have found fascinating. And they arrived to the Midwest, like Wisconsin, before the railroad had come through in 1861, mm-hmm. coming in 1856. So they had to find transportation by through the Erie Canal and through the Great Lakes and got off at Racine, Wisconsin. Sure. Others came after the railroad came to the Midwest. And, and that, that, so it segued from there into... Everybody seems to enjoy reading the first half of the book because it speaks to their own history. And uh, the second half, I, I tell people, it will probably not pertain to you if you're not related to the people. Because mm-hmm. here's where I get to the names of parents and grandparents and marriages and uh, uh, the immigrant uh, uh, history in, in, in filing a homestead. It's a little bit of a Laura uh, Wilder type of uh, sure. book at the end. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let's – so – from ancestry, let's go to your life growing up. Uh, where, where were you born, and then what was life like growing up for you? I was born in Watertown, South Dakota. My parents, uh, I was the oldest, first born, and, and they had a, an upstairs apartment in the house. Dad was working at Swift's, and Mom was working at uh, Herberger's, or in the year, switched to uh, Montgomery Ward. But sure. anyway, uh, Dad had just bought a quarter next to his parents' land, and he wanted to develop it, uh, and... Uh, he started building a house the, the year I was, my mom <laughs> my mom was pregnant and so I was born and after by the end of my uh, first year we uh, we moved out to that new house on the farm so I grew up on a farm okay. uh, from Florence so I was baptized uh, in Esteline uh, south of Watertown but then all my other sacraments were in the parish of Florence okay. and it was uh, I was the oldest of five and 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 farming. Uh, uh, was uh, was fun actually for me. I except milking cows. We hated that. My <laughs> brothers and I, but w- uh, we didn't mind the chores. Watching the baby pigs be born and even yeah. feeding the chickens and picking up the eggs, doing hay and harvest was great. But milking was, in fact, when I went to the seminary, in the back of my book, I have me milking cows at the Sioux Empire Fair. I entered a contest of hand milking since I still knew how to do that. <laughs> And my younger brothers uh, accused me. The only reason I went off to a high school boarding school, the minor seminary, was because I wanted to get out of milking, which I totally <laughs> denied back then. But now I tell them that's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, I've heard that from other people back in the day, too, that milking was not their favorite task. And, and that landscape has changed quite a bit from the, from the family farm, family milking farm. Corporate, to, to, no. To corporate now, unfortunately. But um, So you went to school in... Esterly, number 19, a county school. It was a uh, one-room schoolhouse. There were 19 of us in eight grades. So there were no such things as there were uh, kindergarten, preschool. So I remember the the first time I saw an alphabet uh, 
on the posted on the board above the blackboard was in first grade after I was six years old. And uh, and then I, after I graduated from that one room country school, I was I was all uh, ready to go to Watertown because I was short for my age. And the two big programs, Watertown High School was successful. And in those days with the debate and uh, speeching, speaking, and they were taking state uh, titles and wrestling. They were taking state titles. I was small for my age. So I thought, I want to wrestle and uh, that'll be the sport I can I can achieve something in. And whatever I do in life, I want to be a speaker. <laughs> so, uh, But at the last minute, the Bishop's Bulletin, uh, stemming from this office, uh, was it used to be in black and white. Yep. It came out fully colored edition. And that was about the 1st of August saying, the new minor seminary boarding school next, uh, uh, next to O'Gorman, where we would go to classes, was opening and receiving candidates. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I have to go there. Uh, some of it was I wanted the education. Some of it was ever since I started serving back in fourth and fifth grade, I, I enjoyed uh, serving mass. And, and I, I used to even play mass when we had a blizzard at home. Uh, I'd be the priest and my brother would be the lectern and then um, – uh, my sister would be in the pew, so to speak. We we, we had that, that little game when it, when we couldn't go to church. And so I knew the priesthood was there, but I wasn't firm on it yet. I, I just, for sure, I have to, I'd be free to decide if I get an education. And, uh, and O'Gorman provided that. It was so lonely. Uh, but my good luck after my first year, I was only 14 after my first year, uh, a classmate and a distant cousin John Lansberger joined me so that we were partners on the bus every Friday night. It was an open uh, school in, in that we could go home every weekend if we wish. And when the weather was nice from end of August until after till Thanksgiving, usually I would stay the three weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas. But I went home every weekend and he was uh, he would ride along with me Friday sure. night on the Jackrabbit <laughs> bus and Sunday night back on the Jackrabbit bus. Sure, sure. So that was a uh, that was a high school. And uh and uh, summers were on the farm working, you know, with everything that we did. And from age 16 on, at least every Tuesday, I was at the sale barn moving cattle. Uh, a 16-year-old could get a job sure. in those days. You usually had to be 18 to get a full-time job, unlike today. But then um, I at least had uh, some kind of money flowing in on Tuesdays all during the summer. Sure. And those were like 12 and 14-hour sale days. Uh-huh. I want to go back to something real quick because this has changed quite a bit. Um, and that's the minor seminary that you talked about. This is right. not a this is not a thing anymore. No, and you know, we had a few very successful classes when we began. Um, I had classmates now Archbishop uh, Thomas Gullickson, who's retired. Uh, Tom Hack, John Landsberger, Father Jim Zimmer didn't come, but he would come in for picnics and gatherings because he was already thinking about it during high yeah. school. But he he was just in Humboldt uh, nearby. He didn't join us, so. That uh, class uh, had several priests, and then uh, uh, the, the next class, Father Jerry Copo. And then, you know, but gradually we weren't getting anyone going on to the college seminary. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of segued from being a, a, a prep school for, for candidates to the priesthood to being a, a, a prep school for O'Gorman High School, I think. There was, okay. you know, the same maybe the same desire I had, but it became kind of exclusive uh, to us. Uh, the athletic program and the academic program drew kids from the rural areas, and they did well. But uh, it somehow the um, the priesthood was uh, was not being nurtured there, sure. and and it just was the dynamic. So when we got a new bishop, Bishop Dudley, uh, he transitioned it, closed it, and opened a youth office and 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 made me uh, the founder of that uh, youth office for the diocese and i became vocation instructor as oh, well okay so and then we had our offices right there the tribunal the minor seminary now is the junior high for o'gorman right that was the first chancery okay. so it was a transitional one after bishop carlson came was there for a few years he re- renovated this old high school at cathedral and now it's the chancery ever sure. since uh and Sometimes there's some there's some use of language nowadays that they call the the college seminary the first four right. years the undergraduate it's a minor part. seminary they sometimes no. still call that the minor seminary Correct. but real in reality it, what the minor seminary used to be was was basically a high school time of like you said prep right. school and whatnot right. so so there's a little bit of a difference there in language um, but ultimately the minor seminary in, in my experience is no more anywhere I don't think correct correct one. So. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, 
the education and liturgy, I mean, music, well, we had a, a, one of the priests at the seminary was good in music, and we would have, uh, every week we'd have our music practice for the, for the masses and chant, and, and, uh, in, and two of the priests, Father Androsko, Father Chris Polsky, taught Latin, so all of us had to take four years of high school Latin, mm-hmm. and then a foreign language, German, French, or I was put in a French class, or Spanish. And so, as a prep school, it did serve beautifully as a foundation for oh, sure. for seminary sure. later on. Sure. Now, and you had mentioned this when you saw the the bishop's bulletin that the minor seminary was opening. Was that? And you kind of alluded to the fact that it kind of hit you. Was that where you first heard the calling, or did it kind of develop as you were at minor seminary? You know, I think it's probably the first time I articulated. You know, I've thought of this, but I don't think I ever spoke to my parents about the priesthood, and I definitely did not speak to any friends. And I don't think I even mentioned it to my brother or sister. Uh, I think that with that bulletin, now it took it, 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 it takes a little influence from several sources. A, I had uh, I had a pastor. Uh, he was at Florence for 22 years. Father John Naborski had been through Dachau, uh, tortured by the Nazis for several years in the concentration camp, and now he had been our pastor for years, always encouraging vocations. And my first view of that bishop's bulletin was followed up, I think, within a day or two. He came out holding it in his hand, and said, he always he always called the women in his parish ma'am. And he saw Dad, and he said, sir, ma'am, he said to my mom, I think your boy ought to go here. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, I guess no protest from me. I'd already brought it up. And I know it was hard for my parents who were struggling to uh, – uh, with farm work and finances, and uh, to lose their number one chore boy, uh, but they they supported the vocation, but probably would not have happened if they didn't support it, and said, "We'll we'll take you down there, and we'll take a look at it," and uh, and then I had you know grandparents were always were praying for priests in in their family too. So you, oh, yeah. you have to realize there's all these influences, yeah, unseen, right? That you can't see and the, and, and whatnot. Uh, we're about halfway through, so if you're just joining us, we're at Catholic Views. We're sitting here with Father Mike Wensing, talking about his vocation story growing up, uh, what life was like, and how he heard his calling. So we, we've we worked through minor seminary. You're done right. with minor seminary. Did you go right into uh, – and, and two questions there. Did you go right on into college seminary, and did it look – was it the same as it is today? It's another eight years that we would have been looking right. at. And we still send men to Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary and on, on the campus at University of St. Mary's, mm-hmm. Winona, Minnesota. Our diocese had a policy of sending everyone there in those days under Bishop Hoke. Um, and uh, w- w- I remember when I got there, and, 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 and the rector was uh, Father Brum, future bishop of San Diego, was very inspiring. And I, it was like a, f- a breath of fresh air, these new group of priests and uh, so articulate and and uh, talented uh and of course college can be exciting in itself and so it reaffirmed I, i'm on i'm on the right course i thought but uh i remember uh, uh that was a, a transition that was difficult uh i had a date in the senior they didn't have proms in those days at O'Gorman, the senior dinner night they called it and uh, someone I was, had been a, in a crush over, but oh. so I mentally had to break uh, that off and uh, and participate 100 percent in a college program. They said philosophy would be a good major for theology, but I already was hedging my bets, and I double majored in philosophy and clinical psychology. Oh. And so I graduated with those two degrees because I, I it showed that there was a little. Uh, I was still struggling with. Uh, I never struggled with studies, I and mean, I was so excited about learning the theology and the history of the church. That's what that was a very good bonding force uh, is the uh, academics towards the priesthood. Uh, the uh, difficulty I was struggling with is having come from a good family, uh, wanting to be married and have a family of my own. So I would say if there was a number one struggle with my spiritual director, it was always is that uh, is that is that uh, good or is that bad to feel that tug uh, so strongly, and yet wanting to be a priest and he says well welcome to the real world so for some they knew they were going to be a priest from the time they were a boy for others like yourself and one of the spiritual directors said or like me and he's told about his struggle uh, he says it's kind of typical in fact uh, he said uh, i might venture to say maybe you wouldn't be a good priest if you also would not be a good father and husband well that's very interesting it's and i thought really it was a great insight uh, so i thought it was God was giving me this struggle in order to make me a better priest. Sure. So how would I be a husband? If I daydreamed about that, how would I be a father? And at the same time, it was helping me, how will I be a spiritual father? Sure. 
and a spiritual husband of, of the bride church, you know. Yes. And so I, I didn't know that, but the, the spiritual director was very clever planting that into my life, uh, that, you know, welcome to struggle. And he didn't predict what the conclusion would be because he knew that it was going to be up to uh, the grace of God in my decision. And so... Uh, and I mentioned this a little bit in, in the Bishop's Bulletin article that at the end of uh, the four years, uh, actually, was, I graduated from college in three and a half years. I took extra credit. You know, when you don't have any money to go out on weekends, you, uh, uh, I, I uh, usually would study, <laughs> although I had three <laughs> jobs. I did dishes uh, uh, because I didn't want to borrow money to go through college. And we, in those days, we were kind of on our own for college under Bishop Hoke, and I became a barber i had a barber chair oh, in the really? basement, right and so i cut a lot of hair I had no idea that you faculty started coming over to me and and uh and but it had to be just a donation since i was like i inherited hair from a, a <laughs> seminarian who had graduated ahead of me so i inherited all the equipment in the barber's chair Interesting. And so then the third job on the weekends is i w- would take care of all the dormitory uh, lavatories and uh, so i had three different jobs to uh, bring in the money to pay the tuition and, uh, and then I would do homework. So uh, once in a while, we'd go out maybe uh, for pizza and, and, yeah. uh, and a movie, but it was usually not more than once a month because of the budget I was, I was under. Sure. Anyway, when I came to the end of the three and a half years, Dr. Johnson, the head of the psychology department, called me in, and I had done very well with it, so much so that he, he said that he had graduated from the University of Chicago, and he said that he'd uh, held in his hand, because he said, if you ever find a likely candidate, um, they can apply, and with your recommendation, most likely he will uh, be able to get that fellowship towards a PhD mm-hmm. in clinical psychology. And he said, "I think you're the candidate, and I will back you all the way." Oh my goodness! I said, "I got to go pray about this." And I had a few sleepless nights that I sweated out because I thought it's like God says, "Okay, you want an option? Here you have it. What are you going to do?" Uh, you also know that the way is open to you for the major seminary because St. Paul Seminary had accepted me already, and and. Uh, I don't know, it hit me after a couple of days that um, it was time to uh, quit fussing around. What did I really want? Deep down, I wanted the priesthood. So I went in and, and apologized to Dr. Johnson uh, for uh, saying no, but he said, why don't you get it, get the degree first, since it'll be a free ride, and then go to the priest. And I said, no, it's a matter of momentum. <laughs> the trouble is, is I will go off to Chicago, and in grad school, I will meet a beautiful young lady and it'll be curtains. I said, it's momentum. If I don't keep the momentum now, uh, I said, into the seminary, I will probably be bowing out. I said, I, some people can do that. They can go on and get their doctorate and, and then re-enlist in the mm-hmm. seminary. Mm-hmm. But I said, that's not my nature. That's a, uh, the whole story that you just had about seminary is, uh, this is Vocations Awareness Week this week. This, uh, the episode won't be airing until the week after, but right now as we're talking, it's Vocations Awareness and I think some of the things you said in there were very profound, especially when you were talking about the tug between the priesthood and being having a family and a father. Because I think some of the ideas around this is that a guy goes off to the seminary and he's he either knows for sure all the time or uh, or there's no real room once you go to discern. And and, uh, and really profound statement that you said that it, uh, a priest is is also somebody who could be a good father or husband too. Uh, right. I think that's really important for people, especially young men, to remember nowadays that as they're thinking about seminary, it's 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 about it discerning and it's about you know being the best you can, whether it's a priest or a husband, being the best right, father. Right. And you know, graduating in three and a half years, a lot of a lot of it had to do with finances. Uh, this I, I didn't have to pay a semester of tuition, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, the minor seminary was open. Uh, Father Androsko was both rector and still vocations director. And, and another classmate graduated in three and a half years, Tom Heck, and who's retired in Florida now. But he invited the two of us to come out and to work uh, with the diocese and vocations office. Uh, there'd be a little stipend. Mostly it was just room and board and small stipend. And we would travel because he was so busy with the minor seminary. We would travel on behalf of the vocations office as two graduate, high college graduate uh, students going to St. Paul Seminary. And give talks at all our, not only our Catholic high schools, but all our religious education classes that we could. We were booked um, during the day at the, at the parochial schools, but almost every Wednesday and a few Sundays that had a religious ed programs sure. to go out and speak. And, you know, we had a full um, visual program as, as, as well as uh, our, our own witness story. 
it's funny how you, when you give witness, I think it's with people who evangelize faith. If they knock on doors, which Catholics aren't very good about doing, you actually become so much stronger yourself. I mean, you not only have to defend it, but you have to, you're always thinking in terms of how do I explain it? And we were doing the same thing. How do I defend my choice to other 17 year olds? Because we were only a few years older than them. Sure. And how do we best sell it to get them interested? Well, it ended up, it was so convicting to us so that by the end of that semester, uh, in in the uh, end of summer, going back into St. Paul's Seminary, I was uh, I was totally uh, in the race, and it was just uh, it was it was fun to be settled. I remember, uh, uh, I mean, like I said, theology and academics were not a struggle as such. Um, so it was just now fun not to be struggling like that anymore. Sure. So I, sure. I had those good years at St. Paul's Seminary. Sure. Well, we've reached the end of the time for this episode. We didn't get as far as I wanted to because it's, it's been such a rich conversation. I think what we're going to do is continue this on in the next episode, and then we'll get into, uh, Father Wensing also wrote a book recently, or excuse me, a manuscript that he's working on about the afterlife and different notions of the afterlife throughout Jewish history and Christian history and how that relates. So we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, but for this episode, Father Wensing, I appreciate you coming on and talking Thank to you. us. We'll continue Thank on you. the conversation. And that wraps it up for today. You can always find us on YouTube, Spotify, uh, Captivate Podcasts. Uh, and uh, as always, thanks for tuning in, and until next time, thanks.